Phil Muscatello and FinPods are authorized reps of Money Sherpa. The information in this podcast is general in nature and doesn't take into account your personal situation. Shares for Beginners. Weekend Watch List. G'day and welcome back to Shares for Beginners Weekend Watch List, where we take a close look at an individual company that you may wish to consider for your watch list. It's not a recommendation to buy, but a way for you to learn how Stockopedia screens for value. Joining me today is Chris Batchelor, and we're talking Hanson Technologies, ASX code HSN. Chris, I was um, reading your article about it on the Stockopedia website, and what really caught my attention that most tech companies are fast-growing cash burners. (laughs) Why is the Hanson story different? Yeah, Phil, so typically that's what we associate with technology. But as you know, tech has actually been around or IT has been around for most of our lives. And so a lot of these companies are quite mature and well-established. You think of big companies like Microsoft and Cisco and others. They're not startups. They're not burning through cash. They're actually generating lots of cash. And Hanson is a similar story. They're a mature company. They've been around for over 50 years. They've got a very well-established customer base. They generate really strong profits and, importantly, really good cash flow. So what that means, of course, is that they're not burning through cash. It also means that they're not a high flyer. So they're really more of a steady grower. They typically grow between 5 to 7% in terms of their revenue. And that's the sort of targets that they set for their organic growth. And I guess just to backtrack for a minute, what do they do? Well, they design and provide customer information and data management software for utilities, energy companies, and communication sectors. So if you think about that client base, well, they're fairly staid, steady types of companies as well. It kind of flows through that uh, Hanson follow a similar profile. Some of their customers, you know, they've been with them for over 10 years on average, they're leading customers. So these are long, steady relationships that they have with these big corporate or government entities that they serve. But I had a look at the share price chart and um, there was quite a significant drop over the last month or so. What happened there? interesting it has fallen seven percent i went looking for a catalyst and can't find one in particular i guess just a few things to note one the market over just the last week or so has started to come off as people have got more concerned that interest rates are not going to come down as as quickly as what they perhaps hoped but also of hansen trades or was trading and still is to some extent on a fairly high valuation even after the the recent fall it's still trading on a pe of above 20 and As I described in the intro, they're a steady, slow-growth company. They're not a fast-growing company like a a typical what you might associate with technology. And so those sorts of PEs, 20-plus PEs, you generally associate that with high-growth companies. And Hanson are not in particular a high-growth company. So I suspect there's just been a little bit of a realisation of that. It doesn't really detract from the quality of the business, but it's more just a, a re-evaluation of the appropriate valuation for this company. They are really trying to grow the business, but that happens through M&A. And what's happened is they're very disciplined about how they go about their M&A. And that means that they're particular about what they buy and there's not always a lot of opportunities to buy things. Over the last few years, they've only managed to make a few sort of small bolt-on acquisitions. But what they did do, and I, I thought this was quite interesting, two years ago, they were touting this revenue target of $500 million by 2025. Uh, right now, they're a bit over three hundred million. There's no, I haven't seen anywhere where they've dropped that target officially, but I've just noticed it's been absent from all the more recent communications. And the reason, obviously, is that barring a major acquisition, they're very unlikely to get anywhere near five hundred million in what is that, what eighteen months or so t- time. So, you know, they're not a high growth company, but they are a solid company. What sort of companies have they acquired in the past? You'd presume that they would be looking for companies that would provide synergies. Is that the the way that they approach those? Yeah, exactly. That's exactly what they look for. They look to expand in pretty much the same field but adjacent markets. So the most recent one was a company they acquired just in February called Power Cloud. Now, they are a software firm that developed software for utilities 
in Germany and some of the surrounding countries. It was a fairly small acquisition. They're investing a total of 30 million euro. 17 of that is the purchase price and 13 is to bump up the working capital. The company that they've bought, PowerCloud, is actually trading at a loss at the moment. They believe they can turn that around. But that's just a very clear example. It's very similar software. There'll be a lot of synergies. Yeah, same market that they know well. Uh, just in a different geographic location. So it gives them uh, a, a greater footing into the European market. And that's worth noting that the company operates internationally. It's not just an Australian-based company where the revenue comes from, is it? That's exactly right. In fact, that they are majority uh, overseas-based. So their biggest market is the EMEA. It's about 58% of their revenue. The remainder hang on, is... Wait, hang on, that was jargon. What's an EM? EM- oh, what? sorry. <laughs> EMEA stands for Europe, Middle East and Africa. Oh, okay. Um, I hadn't heard that one before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the rest of their revenue, the, the remaining 42%, comes for about half from the Americas and, and half from Asia Pacific. So very much a global company. Tell us about the balance sheet and how Hansen has paid down debt and paid dividends at the same time. I, I saw the chart in your article about the, the amount of debt and it's uh, been reduced significantly over the last few years. Yeah, exactly. So as I mentioned, they generate significant amounts of cash flow. Now, given that they haven't been doing any M&A aside from that relatively small purchase just in the last couple of months, they have been able to use that cash that they've generated to pay down debt. And they've actually, at the end of last year, at at December 23, they had reached the point where their cash was in excess of their debt. So their net cash positive. That will have reverted a little bit with the acquisition of PowerCloud, which they funded purely through debt, but still it's only quite small in, in the scheme of the overall size of their business. So very, uh, you know, that cash enables them to have a lot of flexibility and, of course, to pay dividends as well. So they've been able to pay out some solid dividends uh, out of that money. As a side note, let's just have a quick look at about the importance of a solid balance sheet because often we just focus on revenue. But um, for you, it's really important to have a strong balance sheet as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's pretty much, to be honest, once I've sort of got an inkling that I'm interested in a company, one of the first things I look at is the balance sheet. And if the balance sheet is not something I'm comfortable with, then I don't do any further investigation. I move on to something else. And the reason is that that's where most of your risk or a large portion of your risk lies. Obviously, if you have a lot of debt, that's fine if you can service that debt. But if something starts to go south, you know, your revenues decline because of any number of different reasons, all of a sudden you're in trouble because you can't service that debt. Whereas if you have a small amount of debt and your revenues decline, sure, it's not great, but you, you're going to get through, you know. And I guess I'm a conservative investor, but I look for companies that do not pile debt upon debt up on their balance sheet. And debt's not the only thing you're looking at in a balance sheet either. You look also look at things like intangibles. If a company's assets are all intangible assets, so things that you can't touch and feel. Um, is, that, is that things like brands and so forth? Yeah, it, it's brands. But a lot of the time what it is is what's called goodwill. And goodwill is generally the difference when, when a company acquires another company, they get a certain amount of assets that they can measure and then they pay more on top of that and the difference is called goodwill and sometimes that can be a really significant amount of money which is fine but what quite often happens is that companies have to write down that goodwill when they realize that oops we paid too much for this company and we're not going to generate the profits that we thought we were going to generate so that's something to also be mindful of and you also want to look at the structure of the balance sheet. So balance sheets are divided into current assets and liabilities and non-current. And so current basically means something that's falling due within the next 12 months. So if a company has a lot of debt and it's going to fall due in the next 12 months, well, they're going to have to refinance that or pay it off or something. And so you want to look at that and be comfortable that they have a strategy to get around that impending deadline. Are you picking shares on gut instinct? Buying on press tips or rumours, do you struggle to find the time to keep up with the research and analysis that goes into evaluating potential stocks? Stockopedia are pleased to offer a special deal to listeners of this podcast, a 14-day free trial and a 10% discount on the first year of membership. Sign up now at y.stockopedia.com sfb. There's no better time to access the most comprehensive, easy-to-use investing toolbox for DIY share investors. 
10% off, 14-day free trial and a 30-day money-back guarantee. That's why.stockopedia.com slash sfb. Okay, getting back to Hanson, who is the man with the name on the door and how are his and shareholder interests aligned? Yeah, so Hanson, the managing director of Hanson is Mr. Andrew Hanson, and he is the son of the founders of the business. Now, up until June of last year, he was CEO as well as managing director, which meant that you know he was running the business completely. In June of last year, he transferred the responsibilities for the CEO role, so all of the operational functions, to another gentleman called Graham Taylor. Hanson himself is now focused on strategy, and in particular, that means focusing a lot on the M&A side of things. Now, his family hold 28 million shares, or about 14% of the company. Uh, They did hold more than that. They sold uh, 3.4% of the company's shares last year, last August, for about $38 million, their reasoning being to diversify their family holdings. But nevertheless, it's still a large stake. Now, sometimes corporations will fall into the trap of expansion for expansion's sake. And as a shareholder, that's something you've always got to be uh, aware of. And Senior management can sometimes have perverse incentives whereby, one, it's an ego thing, everyone wants to run a bigger business, but two, their remuneration may well be based on measures such as revenue or profit, which grow as the size of the business grows. But as an investor, as a shareholder, what you're looking for is the actual earnings per share. How much of those earnings are coming back to you and does that change via an acquisition? If the management have a strong shareholding, then they also are going to benefit from an investment or an acquisition that has a material impact on earnings per share. So that way, your interests as a small shareholder are aligned with those of management and you're less likely to get these sort of ego-driven empire building type expansions. And you'd think that uh, this company would have a lot of experience in that area over a number of years and a lot of corporate memory about this as well. Exactly. There's a lot of longevity in terms of the senior staff. And there's also, that has been a strategy that they've employed for a long, long time. Most recent was an acquisition they made in 2019 of a Canadian firm, which was quite a significant acquisition. So it's not something that's new to them. Okay, so we've looked at the balance sheet. How does the revenue side of the financials look? So as I mentioned, they sort of aim for organic growth in the 5 to 7% range. And then you add on top of that growth from the acquisition. So this year, you know, they've acquired... Uh, Power Cloud. They expect that will add another sixteen to eighteen million in revenue. Uh, they'll they'll only have owned it for four or five months in this particular financial year, but that will boost their overall revenue growth to about twelve percent for um, FY twenty four. The market's forecasting a further eleven percent of revenue growth in FY twenty five. That will include a full year's contribution from Power Cloud, as well as the organic growth of you know sort of five to seven. In the first half of the year, their profit growth was pretty good at 12.5%. They're operating on good solid margins, 17.5% operating margin, net profit after tax margin of 13.4%. So the financials are generally looking good and we rate it as a high quality company. So you know, we look if we look at some of those measures that I've just mentioned, but look at them over the long term, you know, their operating margin for over five years is seventeen percent. Net profit margin over five years is thirteen percent. Their uh, return on capital employed is twelve and a half percent. Return on equity is thirteen and a half percent. Sorry, I'm rattling off a whole lot of numbers there, but what I'm trying to get across is that they're a very high quality company, very solid in terms of their revenue and their returns and their return on investment. As long as we ignore that um, target of $500 million worth of revenue. (laughs) Yeah, I think they'd hope that we quietly have forgotten about that, but uh, yeah. (laughs) Maybe not reaching the target, but um, still doing healthy growth anyway. That's right. Yeah. And uh, as we mentioned, the the whole empire building thing, putting that aside is actually sensible if if that's all it was. Obviously, they want to grow and, and they know that to grow big, they have to acquire other businesses, but they're not just going to acquire businesses for the sake of it. They're going to acquire businesses where it makes sense. And, and that gives me more confidence in a company when you see them making sensible decisions like that rather than just trying to reach a target for the sake of it. 
So we have talked about the outlook. What about any risks, any kind of storm clouds that you can see on the horizon? Uh, obviously, there's always risks with any company, but compared to a lot of its competitors and other companies in a similar space, the risks are actually quite low. Their revenue base is stable and consistent, so risks to revenue are relatively low. You know, you've got a long profile of their customers with long terms, uh, a lot of recurring revenue. EBITDA and operating margins, as I mentioned, those numbers have been steady for the, at least the last five years. So risks to earnings are quite low. They obviously know how to price their uh, contracts so as they earn a good margin on those. And as we also discussed, debt levels are low. Cash flow is strong. So your balance sheet risk is also quite low. So whilst I'd never say no, there's no risks, there are always risks, but relative to a lot of companies, the risks on this one are quite low. I guess probably the biggest risk from an investor's perspective is the valuation. As we discussed, the share price has come down and the valuation is still quite high based around the sort of growth profile. So yeah, we could see a sell-off in the shares based purely on valuation type metrics, particularly if we see a bit of a downturn in the overall market. So that's obviously something to be aware of. Another risk, I don't consider it a high risk, but it is a risk, is if they did an acquisition and, and did it poorly and it wasn't well integrated or was done at a bad price, then that would obviously be detrimental to the company. When you rattled off those numbers before, and you mentioned return on equity and return on capital employed, just going off topic for a moment, and the Brad Banducci's appearance at the Senate hearings this week, where they were, who was supposedly, or was it the Senator Nick McKim saying, what's the return on equity? But the, the Finn reviewers um, basically had a series of articles recently saying how re- return on capital employed is much more important figure than return on equity. Did you have any thoughts on that? It kind of depends on your perspective as to where you sit in the framework of the company. So as a shareholder, you are an equity holder. So return on equity is important to you because that's the return that is available to shareholders. From the perspective of the business, return on investment does make a lot of sense. And I think um, Mr. Bandun, she had a, a valid point there in that Return on equity is very heavily influenced by the amount of debt that you carry on the balance sheet. So if as a corporate strategy, you've decided to have quite a lot of debt, then you can certainly boost your return on equity by doing that. And and companies do do that. But of course, that carries all the risks that we talked about with having a lot of debt, right? And so what can happen then is return on equity can be a much more volatile figure. And, And you can see that if you look at return on equity for Woolworths. I mean, when I read that, in the paper as it was happening live, I just went into Stockopedia and within 10 seconds, I knew what the return on equity was, right? Um, But I also could see that what they didn't uh, talk about there was the most recent 12 months uh, return on equity is actually a negative number. right? So the senator was quoting 26%, but that's if you're looking at the figures to June of last year. If you look at the figures to December, it's actually minus 04 uh, and I think that's kind of Mr. Bandushi's point is it's, it's a very volatile number. It's not a really a realistic number as to how they're running their supermarket. Would there be any final thoughts that you have on Hanson? I think just to sum up, I would say that uh, it is a low risk profile business and their approach to M&A is disciplined and strong, which is now managed by Andrew Hanson, which is good. Their operational execution is very good and has been for some time. What it really comes down to is the price and whether it, at what price does it represent a compelling investment. Thanks for listening to Shares for Beginners. You can find more at sharesforbeginners.com. If you enjoy listening, please take a moment to rate or review in your podcast player or tell a friend who might want to learn more about investing for their future.